right? And we've given up everything where we can substitute out. All right, let me give you the supply outlook. I have no idea how much time I'm consuming here, but uh, you're fine. I'm fine, good. So let me talk a little bit now about what the supply outlook is. I spend most of my time on the demand side, demand dynamics, and how we look at how demand and supply interacts and, and affects with GDP growth, and that's what my book will be about, principally. But I do look at supply, I'm familiar with supply, and I know more or less what people are saying. Here's a chart that I see a lot. Um, so if you take a look at the listed oil majors, so these are what we would call the international oil companies, plus or minus. This is British Cast, BP, Conoco, Chevron, uh, Italy's ENI, uh, Occidental, Petrobras, Shell, Stato, Total, and Exxon. Okay, so most of the big boys. If we take a look at what they have done since 2000, their production was 13.8 million barrels per day in uh, 2000, 2012, I an updated chart of this, but it's about the same. Um, their production was the same in 2012. So the production of the major international oil companies has not changed in the last 12 or 13 years. Look at how much more they're spending in capital, in CapEx. So this is the money you spend to find and deliver that oil. In 2000, they were spending $50 billion. Last year, they spent almost $300 billion. So the productivity of capital in the upstream sector, in the international sector, has fallen by a factor of five over 10 or 12 years. Okay, so these guys are under, under a lot of pressure now. So where do we go from here? His CapEx forecast, this is now becoming a little more apparent. So I made a call last year, did a road show down in Houston, where I said we would see CapEx compression. So reduction in capital spending, even at high oil prices, in the relatively near future, and you could see that happen. And this year we'll see capital spending at these very same companies down about 6%. So despite the fact that they're not able to increase production, they're actually beginning to cut their capital spending. And the reason is they're not finding enough places to produce oil, right? They can't produce it economically, they're getting squeezed now. So, so, it's a, so that's the IOCs. The IOCs are 14 million barrels a day, that's about 15% of global production. So they're very important. They produce as much as, uh, say, the U.S. and Iraq combined. All right, let's take a look at shale. So shale has been the big savior, and it's going to be great, and all that sort of stuff. And it has taken our eye off the ball a little bit um, for the last several years. This is a, a chart just this week out from Bernstein Research. It does really excellent work. Um, and this is their forecast for shale production. Now, shale production in the U.S. is essentially centered in three plays, in the Bakken in North Dakota, uh, in the Eagle Ford in East Texas, Southeast Texas, and in the Permian in West Texas. Okay? The Eagle Ford and the Bakken are pretty close to their peaks. They are likely to peak in the next couple of years. Um, the decline rates on shale wells are very high. I mean, it's pretty well known. So these two, in terms of propelling the states forward, our, our, our economy forward, probably start running out of steam in the next 24 months. Then all eyes go to the Permian. The Permian is the, when you think of Texas oil traditionally, that's the Permian Basin. It's still the biggest producing basin in the United States, conventionally. And they're now trying to produce it unconventionally. The results so far have been, eh, middling. They're big hopes, but in any event, shale growth, uh, shale growth is expected to fall from about 1.2 million barrels per day per year last year, which is spectacular growth by any measure, down to about 200,000 barrels per day per year by 2017. So from very rapid growth in the U.S. to negligible growth by 2017 on current expectations. Why is that important? Because oil sands and shale oil growth have been all of the growth in the global oil supply since 2005. All of it. So if I take away shales and I take away oil sands, production from everything else, from Saudi, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, Russia, Norway, UK, you name it, all the rest of that stuff is down since 2005, okay? The only thing that has made the oil supply grow is shales and oil sands, period. It is not the icing, it is the cake. And if we run out of shales, we're beginning to get into trouble. And that's not all. Here's the oil sands. Just this past week, Total, the French company, uh, decided to shelve the Jocelyn project. This is an oil sands project in Canada. And Shell last year halted work on the Pierre River project, also in Canada. Oil sands are very high cost oil. They're right at the top of the cost curve. 
and the cost pressures continue to go up, and of course oil prices haven't moved much. There's a reason for that. But, but they haven't, and they're not going to, and so these guys are also feeling the heat in the oil sands. While I believe oil sands production will continue to increase, you need to understand that's not going to be just a giant open flowing tap. That's going to be a smaller number, 150,000 to 250,000 barrels per day per year. Not bad, but it's not enough to move the global needle very much. And there's more. Russia. Russia is now looking to go into shale oil production, which is pretty interesting to invade Crimea and then need, declare that you need U.S. technology, but okay. It's going to be hard to do there. Uh, they do not have either the industry, nor the legal infrastructure, nor right now the national, um, how shall I put it, uh, a propriety to do that very easily. But that's what they're talking about. Well, good luck with that. They have a good amount of shale there. But the issue is, in, in Russia, you know, that political system is not conducive to entrepreneurship. And then here's a real disturbing one. I don't really mean that this is a really peak oil. I don't mean to make it as peak oily as it is, but th this is the trends that if I look every day, this is kind of what I see in the press, okay? I'm an oil industry consultant, and I, I read this stuff every day. So Saudi Arabia. We don't know too much about Saudi Arabia. We know that Matt Simmons, back in 2005, wrote Twilight in the Desert, where he said, you know, Saudi's going to run out of juice, and they're going to collapse, and blah, yada, yada, yada. It didn't happen, okay? Saudi is still producing today. What it produced then, plus or minus, and it's producing about the levels it produced in 1979. So between 8 million barrels to 10 million barrels a day, Saudi has been able to produce that for a long time pretty much at will. But, and here are two kind of, three kind of things where you look at them and say, gee, that's kind of unusual. Okay. So this picture here that you see, this is the Manifa oil field. This is the shallow water field. It's just off the shore. Okay, I think it's 21 islands, 41 miles of causeway, or maybe, I don't know what it is, 27 islands, whatever it is, you can count them. It's, a, it's actually a really pretty, it's almost like abstract art. Um, this is a 900,000 barrel a day field. So this field would add as much to Saudi production as about a year's worth of shale production to the U.S. Okay, in current days. It's a big deal. You know, nearly a million barrels, that's a big deal. So what did the Saudis say about this? Well, the Saudis said, quote, Aramco officials have said that the field is not expected to boost the kingdom's oil production capacity, but will serve to keep the capacity stable by offsetting the declines from other fields. Well, what the hell does that mean? You know, and this just goes to the industry and you go, really? So you added a million barrels and it didn't move the needle for you? Okay. Um, then the Saudis have announced that, that they intend to spend $25 billion on deep water development. This is 1,000 meters in the Red Sea. And Saudi Arabia is theoretically a low marginal cost producer compared to the IOCs. That's the big oil companies. But if they're going into deep water, the economics of those in Saudi Arabia are the same as they are for BP or Exxon or Chevron. Does that mean that the marginal cost of a barrel in Saudi Arabia is now as high as it is for BP or Exxon or Chevron? I don't know, but kind of that's the way it goes. When we see an oil business, an oil business migrates First does easy onshore, then they do hard onshore, then do shallow offshore, and then do deep offshore. There is a progression that the industry goes through, and there's good reasons for that. It's very expensive to work in deep water. Okay, so if the Saudis have now gone offshore and not increased their production capacity, if they are now going to deep water Red Sea because they're, why? I don't know. So you ask the question and say, gosh, what really is the marginal cost of oil in Saudi Arabia? I don't know, but if I look at the indirect evidence, the indirect evidence says that Saudi Arabia does not have an infinite supply of oil it can throw into the markets at this point. And I would say that the risks there are beginning to rise, based not on anything except the indirect evidence themselves. Okay? The future dark and bright. So let me talk about, uh, you know, it's like, oh, the end of growth. Well, I, I think it's a little premature to bury growth. Um, what we've seen, as I've said before, when you have a recession, oil consumption drops, and from that new level, it, it, it begins to grow again. What we can see in this recession that has been different is not that GDP has not grown. GDP has grown and has exceeded previous levels now. Okay, so there is growth, and it has. But what has not happened is we have not been able to close back up on theoretical potential GDP. So 
what the economy should be able to produce and what it is producing seems to have a large and persistent gap that we have not been able to close. Right? And this is U.S. government data. This is from the Congressional Budget Office and the Bureau of Economic Analysis. Analysis. Okay? So we do have growth. Growth can exceed previous plateaus. At any level of oil consumption, we will grow from there because we get smarter at doing stuff day after day. But what we have seen is we have not been able to close the gap with, with potential GDP for some time, and it does not appear to be closing convincingly right now. When we talk about adaptation, the question is, how fast can we adapt, right? Because if you can adapt instantly to oil being reduced, then oil will have no effect, right? So <clears throat> if the price of gold jewelry goes up, although some people in the room may be disappointed, the truth of the matter is the economy can go on without any particular pickup, right? But if it's our monopoly transportation fuel, then the question is, well, how fast can we offset that? And we actually have some numbers. So in normal times, oil efficiency grows by about 1%, 1.2% per year. If we're stressed, we can grow efficiency by about 2% per year. And then the max seems to be somewhere between 25 and 3.5%. So if we can grow efficiency at, say, 3% a year, which is not entirely demonstrated, but let's say we could, and we have to reduce our oil consumption by a percent and a half, which is what I argued before, then in essence, our GDP growth is going to be capped out around a percent and a half. Okay, and that is in fact what we've seen. And that's partly, I think, or I would argue, what has uh, led some forecasters to, to substantially reduce their outlook going forward. This is Statoil's outlook. So this is the Na uh, Norwegian National Oil Company, Statoil, right? And this is their outlook to 2040. And what you can see is for the advanced economies, compared to 2.7% growth before the recession, they're forecasting 1.5% out to 2040. And 2.4% for EU to 1.4%. So if I take a look at a before and after by Statoil, that before and after suggests that whatever the oil climate is now, or something, is knocking about a percent to maybe 1.2 percent off the GDP growth rate for the advanced economies. Okay? So oil doesn't necessarily prevent growth, but it may very well prevent growth at a, a custom paces. No, we're back to this again. Okay. So if oil's problematic, what's the answer? Electric vehicles today are not competitive. They're still too expensive without subsidies. CNG, I would argue, by my way, should be much more competitive than it is. It's not in the U.S. It is in emerging economies. CNG. I'm sorry, it's compressed natural gas. How we separate the men from the boys in oil and gas, right? With acronyms? <laughs> so, <clears throat> it's actually true. So, <clears throat> how fast can you change a fleet? Well, we know when they brought in CNG into Iran, uh, and they were under embargo and all that, they were able to get 50% of sales, new car sales, to have CNG within five years. So if we said, oh, let's assume we could do that in the U.S., that's a big assumption, but let's see, we say we could, and we got 50% penetration of an alternative fuel within five years, and we started today, even by 2020, we'd still be 80% oil-powered in our fleet, and by 2026, 20, 14, what are we in 14 now? 12 years from now, we'd only be 50%, okay? I'm almost done. What's the future of transportation? I think it's going to look like this. This is the Dorkmobile from, from Google. Um, this is out just last week. What we are likely to see is a migration to battery-powered cars. I think that is going to be happening, but it's going to happen with different business models. So this car will go to 25 miles an hour. It's intended only for local use. So in essence, it becomes a self-driving local taxi. Uh, this is a business model which I wrote down, so this actually might be Google's version of my particular business model. Actually, that wouldn't be surprising. Um, you can make the economics work on these units. In these units, the way they will work, you will call them with your smartphone, they will show up and they will take you. So the enabling technology for this particular car is not the car or the battery, it's this. This is a technology that makes that car work. Because without this, that car can't find you. All right, so that's gonna come on. And then on the, on the risk side, I'd say the risks are, are gathering, and to, to pick up on themes mentioned earlier, um, you know, we have three disaffected powers right now. You can tell how bad a power is by how easy it is to find cartoons about them. 
So Rand was really easy to find a cartoon, and that, <laughs> Obama wants to be your friend. That's not working right now. Uh, and then Russia, all those in favor of joining Russia raise their hands. I like that one. Um, and then the third one is China at the right. And, and essentially, the, the problems with China is that red line, right? That red line is China's proposed maritime boundaries, which extend all the way. Let me put it to you this way. If you went swimming off your hotel in the, the Philippines, by China's standards, you'd be in Chinese waters. So better swim with a passport. Um, that's a real problem right now. And this is, this is getting out of hand, OK? So these three powers met last week in Shanghai at the CICA conference, and that within a couple of days, Iran announced that it decided to, to, to annihilate the great Satan after all, rather than cut a deal. Um, the issue here is that if you have mature economies struggling with weak GDP growth, so that's what I've just shown you, right, then the risk is that the response is the ability and the willingness to respond to these kind of challenges is muted, and we've seen that uh, to the Iran nuclear program and the Crimea invasion. This is not necessarily a GDP issue. It's more uh, uh, democracies have a hard time responding to these things. But the Euroskeptic vote suggests that the EU may not produce a united front against these sorts of things. Um, and these sorts of weakness create a high-risk situation because they tempt what I call the IRC countries, Iran, Russia, and China, to IRC the US and challenge the status quo. So the question is, will falling oil consumption lead to weak economies or resource competition, and is war a corollary of that? And I'm just an industry consultant, so I'm not, I'm not trying to scare anyone, but I, I can sit here and, and you know, it's not, not that hard to be worried. All right. So conclusions quickly. Uh, the economy is almost certainly dependent on oil, although you'll see a lot of people actually debate that. The US economy. Uh, oil, U.S. oil consumption has been falling. It is not currently. It will fall again in the future. Prosperity depends on how fast we can adapt to reduce oil consumption. Adaptation will come in many forms. Efficiency, conservation, social reorganization, and fuel substitution, as well as reduced economic activity at least for some period. Okay? Declining oil consumption does not mean an end to growth, but it may mean an end to historical growth rates. The outlook for the oil supply is as negative as it has been in the last three years. So I have to tell you, in the last two months, just looking at stuff coming across my desk, I mean, it's as bad as it's been in a while. Um, we will adjust at some, fo some form. Self-driving electric cars, I think, are going to be a very important part of the, the solution. And after 2020, this will be, in my view, the dominant form of adaptation in all likelihood. Uh, at the same time, oil-driven weakness in the advanced economies may prompt some powers to challenge the existing order using force. So the risks to the international system uh, appear to be rising, and they're part because China is becoming more confident, and part because China is losing confidence in its commercial and diplomatic skills, which I, I'm not entirely clear why. But they are. And as China goes, so goes Russia, so goes Iran. Because Russia is not in a position to challenge the EU or NATO independently. Russia has uh, one-sixth of the population of NATO and one-sixteenth of the GDP. So it's not in a position to seriously challenge NATO if so pressed. The Iranians, again, it's fun to poke your finger in the eye of the great Satan. It's another thing to take them on in, in, in aerial combat. Um, <clears throat> there again, the Iranians have limited solutions if they don't want to go uh, whole hog military. The Chinese do have options. China can now project enough that it can contemplate a war with the U.S. in the South China Sea and see how it goes. So they are now essentially in the 1776 versus 1812, right? They can do a 1776 and roll the dice now whether they win or not. <clears throat> in another 20 years, they'll be in a position to 1812 where they won't have to roll the dice. They'll know they win. So the question is, how do the Chinese feel about this? Are we going to see that they escalate this whole issue? Or are they going to de-escalate and go back to another mode? And, and I don't know the answer to that right now. I mean, just yesterday, Chuck Hagel was pounding the Chinese somewhere in Shanghai or Singapore or somewhere. But, but the, the risks on this front are certainly greater now than they were even six months ago. So that's my talk. Thank you very much.